part eight of Brigham Young's 56 Wives next on Polygamy. What love is this? In response to a suggestion from a viewer, we have been presenting an overview of each of Brigham Young's wives, 56 of them. Yes. In fact, generally it's, it's uh, agreed that he had 56 wives, but you know, there's different counts according to <laughs> what different people do, but it's only by one or two wives. And awesome. I think it's because his first wife died and left him a widower and then he remarried a legal wife. And so uh-huh. that's why I think there's the discrepancy, but total, total from beginning to end, he had 56 wives. And today we're going to review his 52nd and 53rd wives. And it's interesting to compare the ages yes. of, of his, five, his last five wives because two of them were very, very young, very young, almost three times his, uh, younger than he. Um, and they, they were in their early 20s. But the last uh, three were in his own age category. In fact, these are the age, this is the yeah. age group. This is the list of the last five that we're covering. 52nd wife was Mary Van Cott. She was 23. He was 66. The 53rd wife, Anne Eliza Young, was just 24. He was 66. 54th wife was Elizabeth Jones, 55, and he was 68. The 55th wife was Lydia Farnsworth at 61. He was 68. And the 56th wife was Hannah Tapfield at 65, and he was 71 at that time. So you can see that he quit taking those young girls <laughs> as he grew up in age. <clears throat> and the last two were married women who were married to other men and were living with their husbands as well. So mm, it's boy. interesting. Anyway, interesting. old Brig was getting up there in age. Uh, so we're going to begin with 23-year-old Mary Van Cott. When he was 66, they were sealed together in marriage. She was born in February of 1844, in uh, Elmira, New York, her family had heard about Mormonism and they believed it and they became Mormons and so they moved to Nauvoo, Illinois and then they moved to Utah in 1847 with the other uh, Mormon families. Now she had married James Kirby, uh, Mary Van Cott had, and she became pregnant but she divorced him before their daughter was born. Hmm. And I couldn't find any indication of their reason for divorce uh, but she later married Brigham Young on January 8, 1865. Now, she's said to have been a tall, nice-looking woman mm. uh, with a fair complexion, kind-hearted, and affectionate. It seems like his his favorite wife, uh, Amelia, was very crazy jealous over Mary Van Cott. Uh-oh. She and Brigham, she and Mary Van Cott had one child together, and it was a daughter named Fanny. She died February or January of 1884, and Brigham had died in 1877. Mm -hmm. And so she outlived him by seven years. But she was young. Mary Van Cott was young when she married him. So uh, she she would have died young. (laughs) Um, Now his next wife was Anne Eliza Young. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on her. Uh, She wrote a book about early Mormonism and her story in polygamy and her marriage and divorce from Brigham Young. And we're using references from the book she wrote, Wife Number 19, The Story of a Life in Bondage, and that explains it all. (laughs) So we want to share part of the dedication page uh, of her book. It's heartbreaking. I wonder how well received this was. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. To the Mormon wives of Utah, I dedicate this book to you as as I consecrate my life to your cause. As long as God gives me life, I shall pray and plead for your deliverance from the worse than Egyptian bondage in which you were held. You are despised, maligned, and wronged, kept in gross ignorance of the great world, its pure creeds, its high aims, its generous motives. You shrink from those whom God will soon lead to your deliverance, but he will not long permit you to be so wickedly deceived, nor will the people permit you to be so cruelly enslaved. Hope and pray. Come out of the house of bondage. Kind hearts beat for you. Open hands will welcome you. Do not fear that while God lives, you shall suffer uncared for in the wilderness. Courage. The night of oppression is nearly ended, and the sun of liberty is rising in the heavens for you. And Eliza Young. 
No, that was very, it was moving to me yes. because she explained how we were raised. The outside world hates us and we have to make it up on our own. And we're the only one with the truth and so on and, and so forth. And it hasn't and, changed much, then, has it? <laughs> no, it hasn't through all those years. And she expressed her belief that soon their help would come for those um, yeah. Mormon women trapped in polygamy, but it never did come as she had envisioned it. However, one thing we need to note is that God did send, and he still does, provide authentic biblical Christians to faithful, faithfully deliver biblical truths explaining that polygamy is not a command of God, never was, and is not required for eternal life, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, through Jesus alone, and not by the works of polygamy and of Mormonism. So in that way, you can be delivered by knowing the truth. That's so God true. did send people telling the truth. He still does. Now, Anne Eliza Young exerted great effort to take that truth uh, of, of Brigham Young's kingdom, what's really going on, uh, to the outside world, world outside of Utah and the Mormon territory. She herself had been one of his victims. And so she was able to explain to what was going on from her own experiences. Now, she was no fan of Joseph Smith either. <laughs> she pretty much saw him for what he was, a scoundrel seeking popularity and money along with multiple sexual partners. Mm -hmm. She said this about his revelation that is now Mormon doctrine in section 132. Which is still there. Still there. After the revelation on celestial marriage was publicly announced in 1852, it was stated that Joseph Smith first produced it in 1843, but there were hints of this new doctrine at a much earlier date. It is generally believed and well known by many of the old Nauvoo Mormons that he had it in contemplation at a much earlier date, certain indiscretions rendering it necessary that he should find an excuse of some kind for acts that were scarcely consistent with his position as vice regent upon the earth. <laughs> and set himself right, not only with his followers, but with Mrs. Emma Smith, his wife, who objected very decidedly to some of his prophetic eccentric eccentricities. So she saw through Joseph Smith, <laughs> yeah. which in that Apparently. time, during that time, for a Mormon was unusual. <laughs> Now, she and her family traveled west with the Mormons, and sadly, she discovered that Utah was not Zion's promised land. It was not overflowing with milk and honey as they had promised, but was desolate and destitute, and life was not at all what they had promised it would be. But, yeah. of course, like all pioneers in those times, they adjusted and commenced to build a farm and, and, and to begin fresh new lives and families in the Utah Territory. Now, there's much good information in her book that we'd love to discuss, but we can't. It's a thick, big, thick book, and we can't discuss it all. And you can do an internet search and download her book at no cost and read it for yourself. It's really very yeah. interesting and revealing. But let's get to her story of being Brigham Young's plural wife. Now, the book is entitled Wife Number 19, but it, she wasn't his no. 19th wife. It is believed that the title is because at the time she and Brigham were married, he had 19 wives living with him. Living with him. Now, many of his wives before, before this had died or had divorced him. Uh, her had just walked away. Um, so on page 137, she reveals a bit about polygamy in those early Mormon days. Hmm. Polygamy became so much the fashion that if a man attended a party with only one wife, he felt ashamed and humiliated and would instantly select some unappropriated young woman and commence paying her particular and peculiar attentions. He would dance with her and in the intervals of the dance talk matrimony to his usually not uninterested nor unwilling listener. The poor wife sitting by watching the progress of the courtship with heavy heart and a consciousness of what the result would be. A lady friend who had lived that experience once said to me, I could write volumes on the misery I endured that first winter in Utah. Another one referring to the same period said, I have divided my last crust with polygamy. Well, I thought that was an interesting <laughs> phrase. It is an interesting phrase. Of course, some of these phrases are time dated. You know, sure. we don't understand what, quite what they meant as they knew then. Now, Anne Eliza's father uh, and an uncle both were devoted, more, devoted Mormon men, and they believed that polygamy was God's command, and they didn't dare to disregard it. 
Um, they were all taught that they could attain exaltation by practicing Mormon polygamy, plural sure. marriage. So her uncle had taken a plural wife, and, and this wife resented being forced into polygamy. But Eliza's mother, who was a first wife, encouraged the woman to subject herself to the situation, but she refused. And we have another interesting <laughs> remark about polygamy in one of these conversations. <laughs> mother tried to reason with her, but she interrupted her. If any woman pretends that she is satisfied with polygamy, she's a hypocrite. I don't believe her, and she knows she is not speaking the truth. My mother knew that she designed this remark for her, but she did not let her see that she understood her and determined to make one more effort, though she felt that it was absolutely hopeless. We none of us love the doctrine now, she replied, but yet we must submit to it as a part of our religion, a duty which that religion lays upon us, and we may grow to like it better by and by. Isn't that a sad phrase? Just accept Bad it. answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't like it. We know we don't like it. Maybe it'll get better. Maybe it won't, but we must learn to live with it. It's that's our, not God. It's our religion. <laughs> yeah, it's our religion, but that's not God. Um, also, e Eliza writes of an amusing event about Brigham Young uh, and his many wives and his lack of attention to them through a chance meeting on the street in Salt Lake City one day. Quite humorous. <laughs> Brigham met a lady in the streets of Salt Lake City who recognized him and addressed him as Brother Young, greeting him quite cordially. He scrutinized her closely with a puzzled expression. I know I've seen you somewhere, he said. Your face is very familiar, but I cannot recall you. Well, you're right, replied she. You have most certainly seen me before. I was married to you 10 years ago. <laughs> I have never seen you since, she continued, but my memory is more retentive than yours, for I knew you the moment I saw you. <laughs> that interesting. He didn't even know who she Ten was. 10 years ago. <laughs> and he didn't, she didn't married. name who this woman was, which one of these wives, because we've gone through all of his wives. <laughs> we don't know which one it was, but we do know that the, the stories we've been telling about his wives, he did ignore a lot of them yeah. after they were married. Or certainly couldn't remember. 56. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of girls. When Eliza was a young girl, she and her girlfriends would tease each other about polygamy and marriage. And during one of those teasing sessions, one of the girls turned to Eliza and said, perhaps Brother Brigham means to marry you himself. Well, that comment made Eliza angry. And she said, he won't and I wouldn't have him if he asked me a thousand times. He's a hateful old thing. <laughs> Well, someone told Brigham about that conversation, and even though she was still very young, old Brig knew a challenge when it confronted him. We quote from page 376. Made it more enticing, huh? <laughs> yeah. Most men would have laughed at it as mere girlish nonsense and folly and never have thought of it again, much less spoken of it, but not so Brigham Young. No affair is too trivial to fail to be of interest to him, and besides, in this speech of mine, girl as I was, his vanity was sorely hurt. If he has one weakness above all his other weaknesses, it is his vanity regarding the power he possesses over my sex, and to have his fascinations called in question was a sore hurt for his pride. Okay, <laughs> and we'll see that later as we go on through her story. Now, one, one day, not very long after this little session with the girls teasing each other, Eliza was walking home, and the presidential carriage approached her. And Brigham was alone in the carriage, and he greeted her kindly and offered to drive her home. And she didn't dare say no. She didn't want to go, but she, he was the president. She didn't dare say no, so she got in the carriage. And then he mentioned her statement to her that <laughs> she would never marry him, and she was so shocked. All she could do was stammer on something very incoherent, didn't know what to say. And that was all that was said of the matter at that time. However, Eliza believed that his mind had then been made up or made up already to someday marry her. Hmm. It was sometime later when Eliza was 18 years old that she met her first husband. His name was James L. D. He was an Englishman. He was good looking and he was a favorite with all the young girls. <laughs> a romance began between the two of them despite the disapproval of many of her friends and also of her parents. They did not think he was a suitable man for her. Uh, and their dislike really didn't matter to young Eliza because she was in love. They were married April 4th, 1863, and the ceremony was p performed by Brigham Young. <laughs> <laughs> Within a month of their marriage, she discovered that she had made a big mistake. 
She said she loved him, but he made her terribly unhappy, and he indulged in furious fits of anger and oh dear. threatened her with all kinds of ill treatment. He said that despite the fact that she was bound to him, he wasn't exclusively bound to her. He had the right to see other women yeah. and to marry again. Now, during their courtship, he had promised there would never be polygamy in their marriage, but now the truth was coming out. She says, it was no con consolation to me to remember that my husband had promised me never to take another wife. I had learned what the promise of a man living under polygamic laws amounts to. It is given as a sort of sedative, and if it soothes temporarily, that is all that's required of it. It is considered no sin to break a promise of this kind. Indeed, it would rather seem that it is ac accounted sin for him to keep it. And I knew that my husband was, as well as other men, occasionally reminded that it was his duty to make his kingdom larger as speedily as possible by taking another wife or more than one if he liked. Isn't that depressing? It it's is the dark sad. days then. <laughs> and, and not only did her husband prove to be verbally and emotionally abusive, he also resorted to physical abuse. Mm -hmm. And the first time it happened was when she was pregnant with her first child. Another time he attacked her. Her family decided that for her, her safety she must leave him and keep a long, and it was, it, it, she tells the details of all of it, and it's long and it's sad and it's sordid, uh, but she eventually divorced him. However, she wrote on page 409 how Brigham himself told untrue stories and deliberate lies about her divorce, but he helped her get a divorce. Oh, boy. Okay, well, you knew what his yeah. ultimate motive was. Since I have renounced Mormonism, Brigham Young and his followers have said that I left my first husband on purpose to become his, Brigham's, wife, a statement which no one better knows to be false than Brigham himself. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. Now, Brigham had not forgotten the statement that she had made when she was a young girl that she would never marry the hateful Brigham Young, and he had set out to manipulate her into marrying him. Despite the fact that during a conversation between the two of them, Eliza had told him she had no intention of ever getting married again. She wanted to spend her time being a good mother to her two sons and raising them up to be good men. Um, now, there's one thing that powerful polygamous men do not like to hear. <laughs> and that's the word no. And especially if that word no comes from a female. So unknown to her, Brigham began planning her marriage to him. All this time he's running the country, as, or the Zion, as the governor. He must have... Uh... Well, well, we're going to find out <laughs> later that during this time he's, quote, he's courting Mary Van Cott, the one that, that we talked about So he's about courting first. multiple women and trying to run the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. state of and Utah And doing all this something. dirty work behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> and making money. Yeah. Brigham told his father that he wished to see him told my father, I'm sorry, that he wished to see him on important business. They were closeted together for two hours, talking very earnestly. I supposed it had to do with church matters. I certainly had no idea that I was the subject under discussion, that my future was being planned for me without any regard to my will in the matter. Had I known it, I should by no means have gone about my duties with such a light heart, nor frolicked so gaily with my children." At the end of the two hours, my mother was called into the room, and the discussion was resumed. After a short time, all came out. Brigham went away, bidding us all goodbye with much cordiality and with an added impressiveness in his manner towards me. When he had gone, my father told me the subject of their long conversation. Brigham Young had proposed to him for me as a wife. Ooh. <laughs> well, this didn't sit well with Eliza at all. She was being manipulated and she knew it, but her parents did all they could to convince their daughter to marry the most powerful and the most influential man yeah. among them, the head of the church for heaven's sakes. Now, of course, this is typical of the manipulation and the coercion of polygamy that still goes on today. Yeah. And anybody, any woman who's been in it will, will be able to relate to this kind of, of uh, coercion. Uh, and, of course, you'll have to read the book to discover the horrible methods that they used and the arguments that they used to pressure her to the marriage. And they finally did wear her down, and she capitulated. 
Her mother used the pressure of losing her salvation if she refused Brigham. <laughs> now, isn't that what Section 132 says? God isn't will destroy you yeah. if you don't do this. And her father used the guilt trip that Brigham could ruin him financially and cut him off from the church if she didn't give in and marry him. Now, her own brother had previously been financially ruined by Brigham's cheating. Hmm. So she experienced the required guilt trips of being a totally wicked person because of her hatred of polygamy and fighting against what they said was God's will for her. Brigham made the plans for a secret marriage. She wrote this. He was very anxious to have the affair over as soon as possible, so we were married on the 7th of April, 1869, at the endowment house. Heber C. Kimball performed the ceremony, and I was the wife of the head of the Mormon church, the turbulent, passionate, shrewd, illiterate, strangely powerful man. <laughs> illiterate. That illiterate. Was yeah, he one time said that he didn't think that people should have much schooling, <laughs> right. and then they named a university after him. Yeah, that's funny. Eliza then tells the story of her married life. If you can call it that, <laughs> married life at all, but first... We have to go back to wife number 51, Amelia Folsom, Brigham's favorite wife. Amelia had been 24 when she married Brigham Young. He had been 61. Now, she is said to have been spoiled, Amelia, and she was given to temper tantrums, but he spent more time with her than all of the other wives combined. Mm -hmm. Eliza writes that Brigham kept his subsequent plural marriages secret from Amelia for as long as he possibly could. Wow. At the same time that he was wooing uh, Mary Van Cott for marriage, he was also uh, wooing Anne Eliza, which I mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Um, and, of course, we talked about her earlier on in this program. But, but with that, all of this in mind, this is what Eliza said about the secrecy of her marriage. <laughs> Poor Brigham. <laughs> We were to be married very secretly, as he said he wished to keep the matter quiet for a while for fear of the United States officials. I found out afterwards, however, that it was the fear of Amelia, for she had raised a furious storm a few months before when, as I previously said, he married Mary Van Cott, to whom, by the way, he was paying his addresses addresses while he was wooing me, and he did not dare so soon encounter another such domestic tornado. <laughs> and that domestic tornado, of course, was Amelia yeah, Amelia Folsom. Folsom. <laughs> and they say all of this is from God. Yeah. I mean, right. it, just, it doesn't make any sense that God would be the author of all of this nonsense. Now, right after the ceremony, Brigham took Eliza back to her mother's house, and there's where she stayed until he dared tell Amelia about their marriage. <laughs> it was three weeks before she saw Brigham Young again. He visited her for just a few minutes, and then he left, and that's just a beautiful way to start a marriage, I oh, think. Lovely. <laughs> a few days after that, he took her for a carriage drive, and she said he seemed to be quite nervous and anxious. He told her he was preparing a house for her to move to, but she rarely saw him, and she wrote that it was almost as if he had no claim upon her. Well, hmm. She was alone. Yeah. What claim could he have on her? Except for when he decided to come and visit. She couldn't go visit him. No, no. That no, would not no. be tolerated. No, not good. He, she had to wait for him to come to her. So it was as if she said, I didn't belong to him. Brigham had gotten his way by marrying her, and now it was as if she didn't even exist. And, and as I have read through this, I thought, this was a challenge to Brigham, and once he got her, yeah. what's left? That's what it was. That's, uh, yeah, Something he, he couldn't have, and now he has now it, so... He, so what, yeah, what of it? <laughs> he, he did it. Yeah. He knew he could, and he did it, yeah. Well, the house uh, that he was preparing for her was finally ready, and Brigham came to get her, and he invited her mother to come and live with her, and she accepted. Mm -hmm. Now, he had actually wanted Eliza to move into the Lion House, but she refused. Um, she said that she would stay at her parents' home, or she would he could supply her a home for, for herself, which is what he chose to do. Um, and, and, you know, when <laughs> polygamy hasn't changed much no. since then, and feelings, people are the same. Feelings yeah. and emotions and the hurt and the pain, the loneliness all remain yeah. the same. Uh, it was rougher in those days, to, to, at least to the extent of this pioneer days, you know. Right. And, if you wanted to go somewhere, you couldn't get in a car yeah, and get the, there in a half the hour. The hardships of, of, of it all. Yeah. yeah. And 
and the 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 telling part I think as as we read earlier this was our religion we had to do it yeah. it hurt we didn't like it but we had to subject ourselves to it because it's our religion and the guilt trips that could be laid on on individuals to mm -hmm. to perform and do what they what they know their duty is right otherwise right. they're not pleasing god and they're not pleasing God. They tell the other people what God's will for them is. Sure. So they're the mediator between them and them. Always conveniently now, for themselves. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, always. And then, of course, uh, Eliza had her mother live with her. Her mother was a polygamist. Her mother had been the first wife, but, but Eliza's father had taken plural wives because he believed in the religion. Hmm. And so for her mother to come and live with her, she was probably giving her mother a break to get away from oh, the pains of sharing oh. uh, her home with her father's plural wives. And they seemed like pretty nice parents. She talks about uh, about the parents, but, uh, but they were sweet. They seemed to be sweet and kindly and concerning parents, but they lived their religion. Yeah. And their religion was not a pretty thing, obviously. Now there's more to talk about. Yeah, there's more um, about her. We're out of time for this time, but we're going to finish up next time oh, um, on Anne Eliza's story and the rest of Brigham Young's wives. So we walk <laughs> away in tears. <laughs> and they did too, I'm they sure, did the too. women. Yeah. Right. Uh, thanks, Earl. You bet. Thank you Thank very you. much. You know, God has used marriage as a picture of his love for us. The church is God's entity. It's not the LDS church. It's God's entity of which everyone who will ever and ever has trusted in him alone or chosen as one bride for Jesus. There's one savior, one bride, one way, one heaven, one God, one faith, one baptism, and only one chance to believe and follow him and no one else. There's no second chance after this life, and there's no biblical teaching for a second chance. It's here and now where your choice must be made. And we invite you to choose Jesus, not religion. We invite you to reject polygamy and Mormonism as a way to God because they'll disappoint you in the end. Taking away the Mormon filter and reading the Gospel of John with the prayer that God will open your eyes and your heart to his truth, you'll discover all you need is Jesus, and you'll never regret it. Thank you for watching.